Of all the plants that I am feeling drawn to these days, alocasia are at the top of my planty wish list. I feel like they're weird, semi-ovular shaped leaves look like little alien heads looking out at me, popping out from my collection to say hello. They are just the oddest, friendliest looking plants. There are really so many reasons to love alocasia, from their unique leaf shape to those gorgeous veined leaf patterns that they have to the unbelievable variety of colors that you see on the market these days. And I am particularly entranced by the alocasia cuprea. Google it. It is dreamy looking. So today, we welcome back Enid from NSE Tropicals for a conversation, shall I say deep dive, on alocasia care and best plants for different types of plant parents. I dare you not to try this amazing genus of plants after listening, sweet plant friend. Welcome to episode 117 of Blue Mango Radio. Plant friends, we are well into seed starting season for our gardens this year, and Territorial Seed Company is the go-to option for seeds and plants for your garden this summer. Territorial Seed Company helps us grow beautifully productive gardens 12 months a year with their unbelievable selection of seeds and plants that they extensively test to ensure that they yield the best tasting, best producing, and highest quality vegetables, flowers, and herbs available. Check out their amazing variety of seeds, plants, garden planners, and more at territorialseed.com and use the code code BLOOM10 to get 10% off your first order. Once again, that's BLOOM10 to get 10% off at TerritorialSeed.com. Stop wasting time on plants that don't fit your lifestyle, plant friends. Take the Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Quiz to unlock your plant parent potential. When you take the free quiz, you learn about your plant parent personality and get a list of recommended plants, DIY projects, and Bloom and Grow Radio podcasts specially curated for you by me. To get your quiz results, go to bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality to take the quiz. And don't forget to let me know your results on Instagram. I can't wait to see. Welcome back, plant friends. I hope you had beautifully planty weeks. Billy and I have had a beautifully planty week. We've been settling into our cabin and making lots of realizations about our light and humidity. I've been pretty obsessed at putting hygrometers all over our house. Those are the little things that measure the humidity in your house. If you haven't already, check out the YouTube video where I break down what hygrometers are and I actually do product reviews and comparisons of two different brands and show you how I use them. So since our humidity is low in our cabin, I've been experimenting with growing some high moisture loving ferns under glass to see if I can hack my way into not killing ferns anymore. And you can check out the fern terrarium planting up I did under glass on YouTube as well. Speaking of socials, for any of you guys on Clubhouse, I'm hanging out over there. Since it's audio-based, I'm kind of curious because we're a podcast, and I'm co-hosting a meeting every Monday at 4.30 Eastern time as part of the Grow With Me series on the Food Growers United room. So if you're on Clubhouse, go give me a follow. Go check out that chat. It's been really fun. And I wanted to say a quick thank you to our newest Patreon plant friends. Thank you, Emma Hoffman, Rusty W., Hallery Sinclair, and Jane Park. Thank you so much for contributing to our community of plant friends who support the show and help me get this thing to as many planty ears across the world as possible. If you might be interested in supporting the show, you can click the link in the show notes for more details. Okay, plant friends. I have been obsessed with alocasia for a while. If you've been listening to the show, you probably know that any alocasia have really been on my wish list for quite some time. So I'm so excited to have Enid back. She gave us an amazing deep dive on Anthurium last month. Definitely go check that episode out if you have any interest in Anthurium. And I'm so excited to welcome her back for this deep dive on alocasia. And if you haven't checked out Enid and her rare plant shop, NSE Tropicals Online, you simply must. All of her links are in the bio. So... Without further ado, plant friends, let's dive right in. Here's Enid. Welcome back to Bloom and Grow Radio, Enid. I'm so excited to have you for a kind of a part two again. Thanks. It's great to be here. Today, we're diving deep into alocasia, which I'm so excited about because alocasia are my pet wishlist plant that I've always been so curious about and so scared of. So I have a lot of questions for you and we have a lot of listener questions. 
For those listening who maybe didn't hear our episode last month, Enid is the mastermind grower behind NSC Tropicals, which is the go-to place for rare aeroids and plants on the internet. She's in Florida and amazing. And we just did an episode that was so helpful on Anthurium Care. And now Enid has agreed to join me again and fulfill my dreams of nerding out about alocasia with her. (laughs) So thank you, Enid. Oh, you're welcome. So it's going to be a very similar structure to our Anthurium conversation because that was so freaking helpful. So why don't we start with alocasia? Outdoors, in the real world, in nature, where do we find them? Most of them are subtropical Asia. I think there's a few species maybe in Australia. Okay. And their climate, is it a very similar humid climate to kind of what we were talking about with Anthuriums? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe even a little bit warmer. They are kind of growing in hot, sticky conditions generally. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like it's hard to kind of differentiate alocasia and anthurium. Is that just something that you just with experience kind of grow to be able to tell the difference? Because they both kind of have those arrowhead, aeroid leaves, thin stems. They both look very prehistoric. They both have a lot of veins. Are there like easy ways to tell the difference or not really? They're related. They're kind of like cousins. So there's definitely some that require a closer look. Generally, the texture is different. You know, they're a little more rubbery. Okay. That makes sense than most anthuriums. And as you get into them more, the beginning, the things you couldn't tell apart as you get going, how could I not tell that apart? So Mm -hmm. it's definitely something that kind of comes with experience. Something I've noticed that I'm obsessed with, and I've shared with you offline, but like my wish list plants right now are Alocasia cuprea, the silver dragon one, and the other dragon one. But the thing that I'm obsessed with is at the top, their leaf is closed. Like a normal philodendron almost has that M shape with the hole on top. But I love that with some alocasias, their leaf actually doesn't have that like slit on the top. And I feel like it makes them look more like alien heads. Like I feel like alocasias look like little freaky aliens that are just looking at you from your collection. What is that? We were talking about Amazonica before or poly, mm-hmm. Amazonica poly. It's all, to me, it looks like a pterodactyl wing. Yes. It's just so prehistoric looking. And there's so many different ones and so many different textures. That's what's cool because you can't like readily say, oh, I have an alocasia, but yeah, well, that one's green. This one's black with white veins. Uh, This one's purple. So there's so many different textures and varieties that it's really cool. You can get into several different ones and Mm -hmm. I just think that's really cool. Yeah. I have a plant parent personality test that people can take online for free and it pairs you with your plant parent personality and like what recommended plants would be good for your personality. It's really fun. But the curious collector is one that comes to mind with alocasia for exactly what you said. There's such a variety of plants in this genus and they all look so different and they're all so freaky looking. And I could totally see a whole Ikea grow house cabinet of like just alocasias and like all the different species would be so cool. I mean, that goes to say for so many different genii, genus, genii, like that would be cool for anthurium or peperomia or anything else. But for some reason, I'm just really into alocasia right now. So they're outdoors. Are they growing at the bottom of the jungle? Are they like a subtropical plant as well, in addition to loving that humidity? Yeah, absolutely. Most varieties appreciate humidity. And I don't know of any varieties that are growing in trees or anything like that, but they're generally in the soil on the forest floor. Okay, cool. So talking about floor, when it comes to the soil for an alocasia, what kind of potting mix makes sense for them? They can take it a little heavier than an anthurium mix, but they do still like the same thing where they don't want to sit too wet. I have a problem here where in most of my houses, I can't control the rain. And then like this year, we got 14 inches of rain two different days, like in one day, two different days. Well, I can't, what do I do? I can't turn the water off. So in an indoor situation, you can control it a little bit better. And usually a soil that, again, a soil that drains well is good because most aeroids in general love water, but they just don't want to be sitting in a mud puddle unless it's an aquatic aeroid. But in general, they really don't want to be sitting in heavy soil too wet, especially in an indoor situation where they don't have as much air circulation. I love that we can hear your little froggies in the background. (laughs) We can hear them croaking. So listeners, if that's what you hear, Enid is sitting in a room full of frog terrariums. They look amazing. 
And in the Anthurium episode, we had talked about folding in. They like to be watered, but they like that soil to also drain and not sit in water. So it's important to amend your potting mix with orchid bark. And I think you had mentioned like Australian tree ferns and perlite and stuff like that. So something that I like to do is take my Espoma potting mix and then my Espoma orchid mix and then some perlite and like make my own little mixture for all of my aeroid plants, which is fun. It makes me feel like a little scientist. It's like a little project. Well, then as you say, if you're doing the mixing yourself, you can go, oh, you know, this soil isn't staying wet enough and this soil is staying too wet and you can add more of the orchid mix or you kind of get the mix right after a while. You're like, oh, this plant likes it a little wetter or a little drier. So it's cool to be able to be your own little mad scientist and figure it out what they like. Yeah, it's so fun. So in terms of watering, once we put them in the really nicely amended chunky soil, what do you suggest? Do they like to stay moist? Do they like an inch or two drying out at the top? What would you suggest? I'd say around the lines of what we talked about with the anthurium, where if it's wet, it doesn't need more water, but at the same time, it doesn't want to be sitting in a dusty, dry soil either. Mm -hmm. So like letting that first inch or two be able to dry out with the bottom being moist and then watering again. And then what about light? It depends on the species. Mm -hmm. Most of them need shade. And some of the real big varieties like Borneo Giant and Sarian and all those really big beastie ones, those guys can be in just about full sun, but all the little black velvet and cuprea and all those guys, they want to be in a little darker situation. Bright indirect light, I guess, would be what it's called. Right. Because you're saying darker situation for your outdoor setup. So I have to get over that. Right. In the 80% shade house is like where I would go with that. Okay. So for us, that means like not a Southern or Western facing window, like maybe an Eastern facing window or like a bright indirect moment or under maybe a grow light. That might be good. You don't want sun beaming in and hitting it, but it doesn't want to be in the dark either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people can play around and experiment with it. I found too, like I have these grow bars in my bookshelf and they actually are more medium light than they are high light unless you really prop your plant right up under the grow light. And so I found that a lot of my medium to medium bright light plants really enjoy it there. And I use it as almost like a plant resuscitation corner too for plants that I've neglected a little bit. So that sounds like it could be a good spot. I've been wanting to try, I have some grow lights on the terrariums and I keep thinking, oh, I need to set up some kind of growing situation experiments out there in the uh, shade house for seedlings or whatever, you know, like terrarium lights, the plants in the terrariums do so well. And and then I take it outside and put it in the greenhouse and immediately they're like, where am I? What happened to my hundred percent humidity and my magical grow light? My really comfy house you made for me in that terrarium. Why are you taking me outside of it? (laughs) That's funny. And you had mentioned, so with humidity, alocasia are more sensitive than anthuriums? Again, there's so many different species of anthuriums and of alocasias. There's no like blanket statement, but yeah. generally it's a tropical plant. Mm-hmm. It doesn't want to be in desert conditions and on top of a radiator or it'll just desiccate it. So I would say in normal indoor conditions, you ought to be all right. They probably could take a little less humidity than most anthuriums. Okay. A little less humidity. Cause I feel like with alocasia and anthuriums, I don't know if it's cause they tend to be more expensive plants. So people just want to like set them up for success as much as possible, or they just seem to thrive with some more humidity around them too. In general, most aeroids probably could use a little bit more added mm-hmm. humidity. Yeah. So interesting. So what about fertilizing? Hey, I use Nutricoat for those as well. And generally just during growing season, like February to, I don't generally fertilize in the winter. Once we get into like October or so, I'm like, kind of just like, I'll catch you next year. <laughs> we'll get a bunch of new growth. Like again, this is because I'm outside. If you've got artificial lights, you can trick your plants into thinking it's summer all year long because you can leave your lights on for 12 hours a day. Right. But outside, we don't get a lot of cold, but if we do, I don't want to have a bunch of new growth because I just fertilized. So if you fertilize, you might push a bunch of new growth and then get damage in the winter outside when you're growing outside. So you kind of don't want to fertilize in the winter. Okay. Got it. So yeah, let's talk about that in the winter with alocasias because a lot of alocasias have a pretty extreme dormancy period, right? Like they lose their leaves more than some other varieties of houseplants we have. Do they do that inside as well? 
do you find? Well, I don't have any, but this is just something that I've read. I mean, one of the reasons why I'm so intimidated by Alocasia is because once I bought an Alocasia in the fall and like all the leaves kind of died back and I thought I killed it. So I composted it, but I think it just kind of went dormant and it probably would have come back the next year, but I didn't know any better. For me, most of the varieties in the winter, depending on the weather, they Mm -hmm. just kind of go like, I don't know, I call it like half dormant where they just look like hell, but they're not gone, but they don't look great. And then that generally seems to be they flower around that time. That must just take all the juice out of them. They flower and whether they get pollinated or not, it really seems to take a lot of energy out of the plant. They're suddenly like leaves are coming out half the size as they were. Okay. And is it normal for their big leaves to like fall down and and kind of die or yellow off? In the winter. That can happen. Okay. And what do we do when that happens? Well, if it's due to flowering, you kind of just got to wait it out until it's done with that. I mean, if it's already started flowering, cutting the flowers off isn't going to do any good because it already kind of already did it. Mm -hmm. But definitely you could trick them with your lighting. If you've got grow lights, you can just leave them on longer and they don't know it's winter. They don't know if there's only eight hours of sunlight in your apartment. There's 12. So you could leave your lights on longer and that should help because I have friends that grow indoors that have lights and like the plant doesn't know if it's January or July. Right, right. Kind of cool. And if for some reason you have the plant on a windowsill and it does kind of experience the seasons and it goes dormant, do you just cut the leaves off and like wait for the spring and like chill out and just have a kind of a bald pot until then? Well, that's an interesting question because sometimes there's something that I do that maybe isn't best, but it's what I like to do. And especially if I was growing something in my house, I don't want a bunch of yellow or brown leaves that I have to look at. Mm -hmm. But generally it's nice to let the plant like absorb the energy from the leaves back into the bulb or the corm of the plant. Okay. Like it gives it more energy for spring. So once they kind of yellow out, then I'll cut them off. But I try to let it put the energy back into the plant. Oh, like suck the chlorophyll back in the plant. But it's tough. It's tough to do because if it's your windowsill and you have 10 allocations, you're like, oh. (laughs) This is unsightly. Yeah, I don't Yeah, that's so interesting. Okay, so when the dormancy happens, let the leaves yellow out and shrivel up and then you can cut them back. And then just like in the spring, is just like new growth going to happen? Like, do you have to do anything? The plant knows. So another thing I was going to say though, real quick, is that when they're dormant, they really don't need water. So if it's dormant and it has no leaves to support, you may not want it, again, baking dry, but it's not something that needs water if it doesn't have leaves. So you rot it really quick and it doesn't have leaves to support. So you're better off just kind of like forgetting about it, shoving it in the corner and waiting for spring. It's kind kind of like an orchid. Yeah. And they will come back in the spring. You start watering them and the days are getting longer and they just pop right back up. Good time to fertilize when you start to see new growth. That's a good time to... um, Okay. Give it the boost. Give it the attention you took away from it in the dormancy season. Waking up, it's like giving it some coffee. Oh, I see you got your eyes open. (laughs) I love it. Plant friends, if you are gardening this year, you should be using Territorial Seed Company for your seeds and plants just like I am. I am so excited to be using them for my first outdoor garden. Stay tuned for more content around that. Territorial Seed Company has the best tasting, best producing, highest quality vegetables, flowers, and herbs available on the market. And to top that all off, they're an independent family owned business that's been in operation since 1979. And they really see themselves as farmers and gardeners just like their customers. And they get us and they work tirelessly to ensure the highest quality of seeds and plants for us to grow. I am so excited to be using Territorial Seed for my garden this year, and I'm constantly blown away by the sheer variety of everything that they have on their website. If you want to grow it, they likely have it. I've been pouring over all the different options of tomatoes, cucumbers, herbs, and cutting flowers for the raised beds I'm going to be installing. And I'm also super thankful as a first-time outdoor gardener for their online garden planner. It's been super helpful in helping me visualize what my first garden beds are going to look like even while we are buried under two feet of snow. The reason why Territorial Seed Company seeds are so awesome is because they actually produce 25% of the seed varieties in-house, which gives them total control over the quality. And if you're not into starting seeds, that's not a problem because they also sell pre-grown plants from those high-quality seeds. 
So they really have an option for every type of gardener, whether it's seeds, whether it's seedlings, or you can take it to the next level of ease and get their no-brainer urban container collection, which is this awesome all-in-one package. You get the selection of your easy-to-grow vegetables from seed that you directly sow into the containers, and it comes with the container, the planting mix, and the fertilizer. So check out their amazing variety of seeds, plants, garden planners, and more at territorialseed.com and use code BLOOM10 at checkout for 10% off your first order. Once again, that's BLOOM10 at checkout for 10% off your first order at territorialseed.com. Have you taken the Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test yet? Well, what are you waiting for, plant friend? It is such a fun and helpful tool to help you bloom and grow your plant parent potential. Here's why I created it. I always get the question, what's the perfect starter plan? And I really don't think there's a blanket answer to that question. I don't think it's about an easy plant. I think it's about finding easy care plants based off of your personality and lifestyle. And as I've gotten to know thousands of listeners across the world, I've noticed these little personality archetypes that keep popping up, popping up, popping up. So I profiled them and I assembled this great quiz that you take, you get your plant parent personality type, there's five, and then in your results, you get a list of recommended plants that suit your personality and lifestyle, some fun DIY project inspiration, and perfectly tailored Bloom and Grow episodes for you to go listen to and inspire you. I just tried to take the guesswork out of starting for you and hopefully take the guesswork out of developing your collection for you. And I think it's pretty cute. So head over to bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality, take the quiz, and let me know your results on Instagram. Okay, back to Enid. Okay, so you mentioned this corm. And what is that? Because alocasias have kind of a different root structure, right, than other plants? Yeah, they, what's cool about them is they've got all this energy stored, and that's how they're able, if they go dormant, they're able to just, like, store all this energy in there. And then they'll send out, probably CMPC alocasias, they send out these little runners that have, like, a little tiny corm with a point on top. And then you can start new plants with those corms, which is pretty cool. And it's usually about the size of a thumbnail or so, like a little ball, and you can just put that in another pot and start all over again. Pointy side. Oh, so is that how you propagate alocasia through the roots, through separating those runners? So if you don't take those off, those things will turn into like little offsets of plants. Okay. And so that you get just alocasias, you do it from offsets or from those corms, which would turn into an offset. Okay. So you can't like clip a leaf and stick it in water and it will grow roots. No. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. So then do you also not have to prune alocasia? You would cut any yellow leaves off or any leaves that you had a problem with, Mm -hmm. but no, you normally wouldn't have to prune it. Okay. Awesome. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. So what about troubleshooting and alocasia? What should we be looking out for with them as signs of uh, something isn't right? I would say with them, the easiest thing to do wrong is to overwater. They tend to, I always say like to rot. They tend to rot. And because they have that corn, they might seem like they're cool and they're just storing all the energy there, but you might've already rotted the roots. So it's really important not to overwater those guys. For me, when we get too much rain, I have problems, but that's the only thing that ever really rots on me is alocasias. Really? Seems like it figures it out, but the alocasias are like, they just fall over. You get a couple of days of rain, you come out and you're like, what happened down here? Is there any way to save it from root rot once the rot has set in? Oh, you take it out, wash everything off of the root, cut off any rot. And usually you can, there'll be like some little fungicide powder or something like that and start all over again in another fresh pot of soil. Mm -hmm. You've got to just catch it before that. Once that corm starts to rot and it's slimy, it could be too late, but you got to let that dry out again and start all over again. Okay. Interesting. But it might be worth, if you do have an overwatering moment, it might be worth trying to salvage it before you just compost the whole thing like I did. (laughs) Absolutely. And sometimes there might be other little corms in the soil because they're in the soil. So many times I don't really label my plants when they're out in the shade house. I like label them when I send them out, but I don't have labels on everything. So if there's a pot of dirt with no plant in it, I'm pretty brutal. I'm like off into the bushes. I toss the soil. And then, so as a result, I have like amorphophallus and alocasias all over. That's so (laughs) funny. I'm like, where did that come from? Like, I just dump the pots when I'm cleaning up in the spring, if there's nothing visible in the pot. So you have like all of our dream plants just like growing in your hedges. Under the benches, in the hedges. Oh my God. I can't wait to come visit you one day. (laughs) That sounds amazing. Okay. I've got some listener questions for you. And this is a question I have too. 
I feel like we see alocasias a lot in landscaping too. Like they've got huge leaves. Those larger alocasias, what's the best way to keep them standing upright and not tipping over? In the ground outside, they must just throw enough roots into the ground to be stable. What about in a pot? I mean, they can take some pretty bright light. Those big ones are, you know, tough plants. In a pot, you started getting some, it was unstable. You could stake, try to stake it. I have noticed with a lot of the big ones, if you move them, they will kind of just collapse. Yeah. So I used to do plant shows and we would unload the truck and like, what happened to, especially those Amazonicas and stuff like that, they just, they're just collapsed. And then it takes them a day or two to pick back up when you move them. I don't know what it is. Almost like they're kind of curling up into a ball when you put them in a truck and move them somewhere. So I don't know if you have any listeners that maybe they buy a big alocasia at a nursery and then they take it home and take it out of the sleeve or whatever and put it where they want it. And then the leaves kind of just start hanging. It takes them a couple days to kind of recover from being moved. Interesting. That brings up an interesting question. Do they like to be pot bound? Do they like to have a larger pot to kind of play with? Like, should we be repotting them? Like what are best practices there? If they're under potted, you probably have less trouble with rot. For sure. Mm -hmm. Any pot in general, if the pot is too big, it's a lot easier to give it too much water. Mm -hmm. I find they're easier to handle when they're a little more root bound. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Because I feel like my thought would be, well, if it's a big plant and it's tipping over, maybe put it in a larger pot at the bottom to like anchor it. Oh, but absolutely. then if you do that, you're you going to run the risk of overwatering. Or some kind of heavier pot rather than just a plastic one too with the extra weight. I have done things where like when I repot it, put a couple bricks in the bottom of the pot as well to add to the- That's smart. So you can do yeah. that too. And then that way you're not like so over potting the plant as well because the bricks are taking up some of it. Interesting. Okay. I love that. We have a listener who said, why does my alocasia keep putting up flowers instead of new leaves? When it's the time of year, which is, I want to say generally fall and winter for me here, they put up flowers because they want to make more plants. In nature, they would be pollinated by beetles or flies or whatever was around and they are trying to make more plants. So they throw in those flowers up with the hopes that they can keep the next generation going. Mm -hmm. I had one just recently produce seed. I mean, something in the yard did it and I've never had that before. So that was kind of interesting to me. Wow. So there's no way to really mess with it. You just know that that's the season it's in and it'll go to flower, set its seed, probably go a little dormant and then grow some leaves for you in the growing season. Yeah, that's just what they're going to do at that time. Generally, they don't set seed on their own. They've got to be pollinated by you or insects. So Mm -hmm. that's generally what they do. And they do seem to kind of start to look rough. And for me, I have... It's funny, I could send you some pictures where I have these big giant alocasias in the ground all summer. They're like nine feet tall. And then as soon as they start to flower, the leaves are coming out like a foot wide. I'm like, what happened? It looks like somebody ran it over. So it's take a lot of energy to put those flowers out. Interesting. Because these are plants that do go dormant, like you mentioned. Do you have feelings on like trying to trick your plant with a grow light and just letting it not go dormant? Do you think long-term that hurts the plant? I hadn't thought of it. Maybe they need that break, but maybe Mm -hmm. if you fertilized it, then it would be like, oh, I don't need a break after all. Like again, in the coffee reference, oh, I need to sit down and you have a cup of coffee and you're like, all right, you know what? I got enough energy to go ahead and do that. So I haven't done that, but I have thought about, let me do some experiments with the grow lights because I had an alocasia dragon scale in one of my terrariums, little tiny thing I put in there. And this got so big in this tank that it was like a bush in there. It must've had 10 offsets on it and it Mm. took up the whole tank and the leaves were all smashed against the glass (gasps) and it's got a light on. And the plants outside were all like in their winter clothes. And this thing was just enormous in the tank. And I took it out and put it outside and it immediately was not amused. Interesting. So if you're going to keep it under lights year round, then you should be fertilizing it under lights. You should be fertilizing it year round too. Yeah. If you're going to make it grow, it is the growing season if you're using grow lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's up to you to determine when the growing season is for them, I guess. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's really helpful. And then one more listener question. What's the best way to get an alocasia bulb to sprout? Is there a trick? Oh, no, we already talked about that. Never mind, because the answer is no, right? If they mean the little offsets that we were talking about, you get those little form offsets. I generally just bury them in new medium in another pot about halfway. And it's like a teardrop shape kind of. And the point is the part that wants to grow. So I just kind of 
put that pointy side up. Oh, okay. It can take a while. And again, it's got to be the growing season because they know when the growing season is and it'll just sit dormant until it's time to go. And again, you don't want to water that too much. If it doesn't have leaves and it's kind of dormant, it doesn't need to be wet either. So you you water it initially when you plant it and then kind of leave it alone until you start to see some growth. Oh my God, that sounds like such a fun project. I know, now I want to go outside. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Well, before you go outside, I just want to ask you one more question and then we can wrap it up. So I've asked you for three recommendations for alocasias for beginners and three recommendations for alocasias for advanced plant parents who maybe already have some basic alocasias. So what would you suggest? I'd say if you're talking the smaller varieties. Yeah, like for indoor plants. Black velvet, dragon scale, and silver dragon do really well indoors. Okay, all my wish lists. And then what about more advanced, maybe more rare alocasias for people to try? Is my cuprea on that list? I hate to say maybe. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's not impossible. It's just a little more difficult, a little more sensitive than the Mm -hmm. one you just mentioned. And also there's a new one, Eslani. Have you seen that one? No. Let's look up a picture. It's just amazing. It's like so purple that it's black. Mm. And another one, it looks like a pterodactyl wing. Really, (sighs) really cool plant. Dreamy. Yes, love them. I have to say, I mean, Alocasia poly is the one that like is everywhere. What a hardy plant. My mom has one and she kept it outside for the summer. It grew so well. It threw off so many leaves. Then we knocked it over. (laughs) It fell upside down on the ground and like literally everything but two leaves were like basically severed. Then those leaves also kind of died off. The plant went through like terrible shock from getting knocked over. If that plant doesn't have eight new gorgeous leaves. Oh, cool. From like neglect, like we haven't done anything. It's in a super dry house. There's no humidity. It's getting bright indirect light if it's lucky now that we brought it indoors. And it's just throwing off all this new growth. And I've just been so impressed with how hardy it is. It's amazing. I think sometimes when something like that happens, they like try harder. Like, no, I'm yeah. not. <laughs> the most amazing thing I ever saw, I was in an office in a warehouse years ago. And this guy was not a plant person, but he had a poly on his desk. And it was like a storage facility. This place was so smoky. Like, I don't even want to be in there. The whole office was, it was a trailer office kind of thing. It was so smoky. You could barely breathe. I was like, I wish he would finish what he's telling me so I can go breathe outside. Right. He was putting his cigarettes out in the pot. That like that was his ashtray. So the alocasia poly is there. The whole top of the soil is cigarette butts. The air quality in there, it was like mildew and like thick with cigarettes. This plant was sitting there like happy as it could be. And I was thinking, I bet if I took that home and repotted it and put it where it should be growing, it would die immediately. It would die. A hundred percent. Hanging out over here. Isn't that so funny? Yeah. Well, I'm so excited in my move to start incorporating some more alocasias and anthuriums after our talk into my collection. If people want to get some from you or just learn more from you and check out your amazing Instagram and all of the amazing plants you sell beyond alocasia, I mean, the plants that you grow and sell are unbelievable. Where can we find you? On Instagram at NSE Tropicals and the website is nsetropicals.com. Amazing. Well, thank you, Enid. It's been so fun talking to you again for another two-part series. So thankful for you and can't wait to see what you're selling this spring. Oh, me too. I got to get moving out there. Get ready for spring. (laughs) Thank you so much, Enid. We are so lucky that Enid has graced our show now four times. Two years ago, she was in the episodes, I think they're in the 40s, Aeroids 101, a two-part series. And now she's back to do a deeper dive, not just on Aeroids, but now she's even breaking down different genus within the Aeroids. So if you haven't already, go check out that Anthurium episode that released last month. And I hope you enjoyed this Alocasia episode. And hopefully she'll just keep coming back to keep educating us and go check out nsctropicals.com for her amazing array of plants. But I'm pretty sure that her site crashes every time she uploads lists of plants, they sell out like within a few hours and her site crashes. She's that popular. So we're lucky that she's given us her time. Like I said, if you're on Clubhouse, check us out at 4.30 on Mondays Eastern time for some fun houseplant chat. You can go find me and follow me and it'll ping you when I'm chatting. Thank you so much to our supporters of the podcast. First off, you Patreon plant friends. We've got some really exciting things that will be launched in the next couple of months. I can't wait to share them with you. And of course, thanks to our wonderful sponsor, Territorial Seed Company. 
One other thing about alocasias that I want to share with you guys. So in my new home, which is a cabin, we're hovering around like 31 to 35% humidity right now, which really isn't ideal for alocasia. So I experimentally brought home an alocasia black velvet. My alocasia poly is a surprisingly hardy plant and has been doing fine. I brought home the alocasia black velvet. It's definitely struggling to adjust a little bit. And I just want to say something that I'm very proud of. I was at my new nursery, Adams Ferryker Farm, the other day. They had alocasia silver dragon, which is one of my wishlist plants. And I almost bought it, but I ended up leaving it at the nursery because I'm realizing that in the middle of winter in a new home that's not very humid and I still haven't quite grasped what my light availability is because I haven't seen what the skylights are going to be like in our house in the spring, I ended up leaving the alocasia because I knew that if I brought that alocasia home and I spent that money on it, it wasn't going to thrive. So that's just a major plant parent win for me that I wanted to share with you guys because I feel like a lot of times these episodes gets us really inspired to get all the alocasia, which I am, but I'm going to sit with my two alocasia that I have right now through the rest of the winter. I'm committing to it. And then in the spring and summer, I will figure out my humidity and I will figure out how to get more alocasia in my life. So just like that plant personality test, there's a right time, there's a right lifestyle, there's a right home for every plant, and you got to make sure that you've got it before you bring it home. Just wanted to share that I'm practicing what I preach. Okay, now to wrap up, I want to continue the series on the show where I introduce you to other podcasts that I have been loving, and I can't wait to play this trailer for you from The Common Cult Pod. This is a podcast that's actually run by two of my dear friends, Aaron and Heather. You might know them. They used to be the Practical Minimalists. That used to be their old podcast. They took a break. They closed that show down, and they just launched The Common Cult. These ladies are so fun, and they examine cults, but then also things that are kind of considered culty that aren't necessarily cults, but they like dive into the mind of these different trends and cults. And they're really fun. It's a really great listen. I highly suggest if you have any interest in cults or if you have an addictive personality like I do, you will relate to this podcast. So I will leave you with Aaron and Heather's trailer today. I hope you all have beautifully planty weeks and you take some time to engage with your plant, slow down, disconnect from a screen and reconnect with yourself. So I leave you with Erin Heather of Common Cult Podcast. And until next time, sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Loyal. Have faith. Believe. Certainty. Manifest. Absolute. Lead all behind. Purity. Certainty. Confidence. Perfection. Be yourself. Absolute. Self. Father. Absolute. Purity. 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 I have always been fascinated by cults. Kind of the personality that lends itself to really wanting to try new things. And the next thing may just be the thing that changes it all for the better. I want to be in that cult. Right? (laughs) When you really take a deep dive into the psychology of cults, you realize there's a lot of things in our society that almost fit the mold. From self-help to Bieber fever, from craft brewing to CrossFit, we are asking the question... When does something almost fit that cult description? When does it become quote unquote wrong? Are there good things? These are all the questions we want to explore and more in our new podcast, The The Common Common Cult. Cult. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your Plant Parent Personality Profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at Bloom and growradio.com slash personality and you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at Bloom and Grow Radio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month and these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. 
You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing.